All right, everybody, settle down. We're moving to the mantle now. We're going we're gonna to talk about diamonds. Uh, I, I would argue the premier gemstone of the mantle, uh, no, with no apologies to Peridot. But, uh, um, so we have two really interesting talks this afternoon, um, one by Fabrina Stola from the University of Padua and the other by Graham Pearson from the University of Alberta. I just want to make two comments about uh, diamond. Um, the first is we've heard a lot about plate tectonics and, uh, and, and its, its role in, in, in um, and, sub, and, and the role in, in metamorphic petrology of, of trying to use PT uh, estimates to, to look at the depth of subduction and, and uh, what plate tectonics does through time and the role of crustal compositions. <clears throat> With the advent of, of the recognition of super deep diamonds as being from uh, as far as the bottom of the transition zone, we now have an opportunity to look at the deepest parts of plate tectonics, where slabs go to die, the fate of very deep subduction, uh, what happens with deep recycling beyond the, uh, the, the arc part, the arc filter. So this is what uh, we're going to hear about today. And um, it's a really exciting time for mineralogy. And I want to also say that the second point is that, to me, this is the uh, uh, emblematic of, of, of the best kind of mineralogy, where you have the very smallest samples, and you try to take the, the most important information from those samples and extrapolate to the entire planet. If you went to uh, another planet, and you were handed from a rover a specimen that had come up from 400 to 700 kilometers, you would just go crazy to try to understand the history of the planet. And this is what nature has given us today uh, in the type of specimens that we're going to hear about shortly. So without any further ado, I'll turn it over to Fabri, and uh, we'll get started. Thanks, Fabri. I have to also thank the organizers and Steve for inviting me. Um, I must say, though, it's very confusing to stand in front of a podium in Washington, D.C. with a sign on it that doesn't say no collusion and no obstruction. <laughs> but, but then we all know that's not true, don't we? So, uh, okay. Bang goes my entry visa. Uh, okay. okay, so what I'd like to talk to you about is the power of a very simple mineral, diamond, and its inclusions to tell us unique information about the plate tectonic cycle on Earth that you can get at in no other way. Um, because the problem is that the, the dynamic nature of Earth means that much of the temporal history of, of the Earth, including its tectonic history, is obscured by mantle convection um, and also by these lids here, these lithoceric lids that tend to filter the signal of the mantle coming out of, say, even our volcanics. Even out volcanics, you have to work hard to get at what's going on down here. And so those of us that study diamonds take recourse in the fact that, that the way to access this material then, or that signal in a purist form, is to get real samples direct from the mantle over a variety of depths. And so Fabry focused on the super deep diamonds because they're very exciting. And I'm going to show you some, some new information that, that tells us about carbon recycling and other volatile recycling right through the Earth from the lithosphere into the transition zone and into the lower mantle. And we can do that because diamond gives us the only samples you can put your hands on. Sometimes you can wear them in a ring from those depths. The other beauty of diamond is that it... It's a time capsule as well because it's physically and chemically robust. And so b because diamonds form, we know from dating uh, programs that, that have been done over many years, form right from the uh, paleoarchy in here through to the modern day, and there's increasing evidence of quite recent diamond formation, then this tells us, this gives us little snapshots of volatile recycling right through time, or right through geological time. These are the tools we use to do this. We've already seen pictures of instruments like this. Um, you need big screens, apparently, to run these, um, these, these sorts of instruments. I think the hockey's on one of those screens somewhere. That's why you need lots of them. Um, and I'm going to talk about the three, essentially three different parogenesis. I mean, the, the, so per periodotitic and eclogitic we use in a very clear sense for lithosteric diamonds, and I'll talk about those first. And then we'll move into their super deep equivalents and talk about some of the stable isotope information in the inc types of inclusions that Fabry's just talked about. So here's what I mean by a periodotitic or p-type inclusion. 
so, so this is the host here with nice high chromium, low calcium garnets, similar sorts of colors in the inclusion in the diamond. And then we've got these eclogitic, the, the eclogitic paragenesis, which is really a basalt, a subducted basalt equivalent. And in particular, the eclogites can have very high abundances of diamond, verging on 15 volume percent. Okay. So those eclogites, actually, if you interrogate the oxygen isotope compositions of their silicate components, give us now a very clear picture that is a tale of hydrothermal alteration happening in the Earth's crust, followed by subduction into the mantle. And, and virtually every eclogite suite that's ever been analyzed, and there are many now summarized by this recent paper by Radu et al., give variations in oxygen isotope ratios that vary considerably either side of the mantle average here. And that's interpreted as the signature of both low and high temperature alteration, seawater alteration of crust. And then when we go and look at the carbon isotope signature of the diamonds themselves, we get a more complex picture because we're looking at two different paragenesis here. So the peridotitic paragenesis, carbon isotope signatures of those diamonds are much simpler. It's a Gaussian distribution with a mean value of minus five per mil that is really bang on and in some ways defines the primordial or, or canonical mantle carbon isotopic composition that we expect in the mantle. Sure, there's one percent, less than one percent of the data actually out here, um, but, but the vast majority of the data are in here. Then when we go and look at diamonds with eclogitic inclusions, we see much more complexity. We see immensely more variation. In fact, there's some additional data, out, much more data out here at minus 40 per mil in, in some diamond diffuse eclogites from Canada. And what I want you to focus on is the fact that, the, that, well, A, that this distribution is multimodal. So sure, we've got this normal mantle signature, but we've also got these multiple modes in the data going way out here to, to minus 20 and beyond. And the, the standard paradigm for explaining that data is that, that, and what we've all focused on, including myself, has been that we, we look at that variation and we say, well, okay, marine carbonates are heavy and organic matter in sediments are light. And so perhaps this spread is a mixture of uh, marine uh, uh, or carbonate and organic matter in sediment. And, and that's been widely accepted, but it, it gives us a bit of a problem in two ways. Firstly, to my mind, there's a spatial problem because you've got the sediment and then you've got this oceanic crust significantly below the sediment. So there's a carbon source that's disjoined from the silicate source. But really the big problem has been with the nitrogen isotope. So here's a compilation made by Pierre Cartigny some time ago. And if all, that, if all the diamonds came from carbon from sediments, then all their, their uh, nitrogen isotopes, delta 15N here, should be heavy in nitrogen. Here's the compilation of the nitrogen in metasediments. But in fact, only about 30% of the eclogitic suite is heavy, 70% of them are light. And so that's always been a big problem. And what, one, of the mo one of the strongest arguments against the carbon coming from subducted sediment. That just summarizes what I've just said. So recently, earlier this year, we tried to provide a solution to, to this, this problem. Uh, this is Long Lee and his, his student here, aided and abetted by my colleague Thomas Starkler and myself. And we decided to take a look in more detail at altered igneous oceanic crust. And it had been recognized before that there is a lot more variability in the carbon isotope ratio of altered oceanic crust. But we decided to really go to town and get our hands on every sample we could. So these are carbonate measurements, not diamond measurements, carbonate measurements. That's why we've got the oxygen isotope ratios. Here's the carbon. And you can see from the carbon that we get values ranging from plus 10 down to minus 25 in sections through. These are different. Um, this, some of these are Oman Gabros. These are all sorts of different ocean drilling program carbonates. So you can see we've got this spectrum of carbon isotopes in carbon in the oceanic crust, in other words, in the same place as the silicates. And so that provides us with a very nice solution to this problem because, so here's altered oceanic crust, here's the eclogites again, because we can explain this dichotomy. So here we've got carbon isotopes and nitrogen isotopes. And before the problem was that, was, was how to explain this 
decoupling of nitrogen isotopes and carbon isotopes. We can explain that very nicely by mixing models that involved simply components from the oceanic crust itself without explaining the sediments. That's not to say that there can never be any sediment, but we, I think the sediment component in these diamonds that's supplying carbon might be in the minority. And so that gives us these, this, this nice scenario where we've got the carbon isotopes from the altered oceanic cross carbonates. Nitrogen isotopes actually come from the clays in there. That's why the carbon and nitrogen are decoupled because they're coming, those signals are coming from different minerals. We've got a wide range, it explains the wide range of carbon nitrogen abundances and, and isotopic compositions that are decoupled. Um, it also gives us this localized environment for diamond formation. And it also means that, I think I missed this point, the point I wanted to make on the, no, no, it's coming. It also gives us the ability to much more efficiently recycle carbon to greater depths. So here's the purple is sediment here. It's very difficult to imagine a lot of that carbon and sediment getting down to significant depths, whereas it's much easier to transport carbon in altered oceanic crust to deeper depths to get into the lithosphere. Okay, so that's a new picture that's emerging for lithospheric diamonds. I'm going to move to the super deep diamonds that Fabry gave a very nice introduction to, and so I, I won't spend too much time on the introduction, uh, introductory material. But so the way that, that, as a geochemist, I like to look at super deep diamonds is that it gives us this fantastic window into very deep recycling of material, because we know, because Fabry's just told us and demonstrated very clearly, that we've got material coming from 800 kilometers that we can analyze. And that squares very nicely with the fact that we know that here are different, here are slabs that are being subducted all around the Pacific here and a few in other places. And it shows you that these slabs, some of them go down to, oh, let's see, into the transition zone here. Actually, a lot of them, yeah, here and pond there. And many of them go through the transition zone and pond somewhere in the lower mantle. And so these diamonds offer us a chance to sample some of that material. In fact, as the work of the GIA group has shown very nicely that even some of these huge diamonds are actually coming from those sorts of depths and that provide some of the fantastic inclusion opportunities that Fabry's just talked about. I'm not, going to, whoops, I'm not going to dwell on that because it's just been covered, but here's just a nice picture I thought I'd show you. Here's uh, magnesium silicate that was former bridgmanite next to ferropericlase, and those two phases have the right nickel partitioning to be in equilibrium with each other at lower mantle depth. So I think we're very happy that this is coming from material somewhere down here. I'm going to move slightly shallower, though, and talk to you first about some transition zone diamonds and, and show you what we can find with the carbon and nitrogen isotopes of those. So here we can get much more accurate depth estimates because majorite gives us probably the most reliable barometer in diamond inclusions. Here's some majorite inclusions here. And so this is a suite from the famous Jagersfontein and, uh, and monastery um, uh, localities. We have Steve Haggerty in the audience, so if you want some Jagersfontein samples, ask Steve. Um, and this gives us a fantastic barometer where we've got majorites going down to almost 600 kilometers. We can use the iron probe to run carbon and nitrogen isotope traverses across these. These are complex diamonds. You can see they literally look as though they've been to hell and back, the, the complexity in the, the growth stretches in them. And so what we find, <clears throat> here's an example of just some of the traverses. Core here, delta 13C minus 23, that's way out in this formerly, well, crustal values of carbon. And they vary a bit, the rim values change. There's probably a little bit of, of carbon isotope fractionation during diamond growth, but only a couple of per mil. So this diamond probably started life with a fluid at minus 23 per mil and evolved eventually to minus 20 per mil. None of those values you can get from normal mantle. Same thing here, but slightly less extreme, but still nowhere near normal mantle, minus 15 or 16 to just below minus 15. If you put the nitrogen together with those diamonds, this is the story we came up with uh, five years ago now. And so these are the, 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 all the systematics of super deep diamonds that have been analyzed for carbon and nitrogen. 
quite complex, but our data at the time, we thought, well, okay, it, we've got uh, light carbon and heavy nitrogen, so that's telling us it's metasediments, except that I, I think now we also have to admit that, well, it could be metasediment, but it could very equally just be the, this carbon-nitrogen decoupling we see in altered oceanic crust too, in the transition zone diamonds. So we don't necessarily need to, to have recourse to sediment, even though we've got delta-13 carbon values down to minus 20. Just to look at this, the inclusions in those transition zone diamonds, these are from Cancan, actually not Yargus Fontaine, because the beauty of the Cancan suite is that we have diamonds from the lithosphere here, so this is a slightly broken pressure or depth scale here, so some, th this is meant to be about 5 GPA, which is the bottom of the subcontinental mantle lithosphere. And you can see that the oxygen isotope ratios in eclogitic diamonds are pretty variable there. The canonical mantle value is around minus 5.1 here. So this variation is equivalent to that that you see in the eclogite zenoliths, and, it, and, it, and it's commonly um, explained as being due to hydrothermal alteration. We've got these even more extreme values in oxygen in the silicates, the majorites coming from the transition zone well out to minus five and even minus, sorry, plus, getting the carbon and the oxygen mixed up, plus nine to plus 12. Even more extreme than these values here. And then we've got, these are the first oxygen isotope compositions that have ever been measured on material coming from the lower mantle and they give actually a value very close to what you would expect for typical mantle material. So much more primitive without this recycled crustal component in them. It doesn't mean to say it's not there, it's just that you can't detect it in these oxygen isotope measurements. When you put that data together with the carbon, then what you see in CanCan actually is, is slightly unusual in that we have these heavy oxygen isotope ratios, some in the lithosphere, but these in the transition zone, but also instead of the light carbon, we've got heavy carbon here, into the, even into the plus values, plus one. Now that is more, that, that you can't do very easily without involving subducted carbonate in, that stays as carbonate to great depths. And we think that this is telling us about different environments, different fluid styles of, or different parental fluids that the diamonds are growing from. So in the lithosphere, we've got diamonds that may grow from, from fluids, well, the silicates come from some sort of lightly silicate, uh, either residual silicates or recrystallized silicates, but the diamonds are forming from fluids, probably hydrous fluids, maybe some slightly carbonatitic fluids. These values here are very difficult to explain without recoursing to fluids that are dominated by carbonatite for these particular inclusions and their diamonds that uh, are forming from carbonatitic fluids. And then when we get back down here, we may go back into a regime of slab dehydration where you've got more normal, uh, these are peridotitic diamonds, you've got more normal compositions in the, um, in the oxygen and in the carbon. Okay, how much time have I got? Four minutes, good, perfect. Okay, so I'll finish on some work we've been doing on blue diamonds, which was really catalyzed by this amazing uh, observation by the GIA group, uh, Steve Shirey was involved, Fabry was involved in this study, that found more super deep, super deep inclusions in diamonds. And as we've just seen from Fabry's talk, make a very clear case that these diamonds are ultra deep, either transition zone or many of them could be lower mantle in depth. And they speculated that this blue color caused by boron here, here's a boron substitutional atom in the diamond lattice. Boron is enriched in the crust and not in the mantle typically, and so they speculated that that must be recycled boron. And so being geochemists, that's the challenge to say, well, okay, we can test that. The obvious thing is to do the boron isotopes. And that sounds really easy, but people have been thinking and trying to do boron isotopes in diamonds for well over 10 years. It is not a simple challenge. You don't you don't just think of this over beer on a Sunday and get the data on a Monday, I can assure you. And you need very deep pockets to do it as well. So, but these are the options. post serpentinite phases maybe, if it is recycled boron, uh, carb carbonates, recycled carbonates, the famous altered oceanic crust, or is it just primitive mantle and there's no recycled component at all? So we were lucky enough to have it's great working with colleagues like Thomas Starkel because he said, oh yeah, I've got about 20 blue diamonds hanging around that I've had for some time. And these are not cheap specimens to acquire, not easy specimens to acquire. So here's 
This is unfortunately a black and white image. You'll have to take my word for it that this is a blue diamond. Um, and it has indeed what appear to be super deep inclusions in it. It's got these calcium silicate phases. These are the slightly odd ones, the larnite and the titanite and the wallstromite, now braite. And it's got enstatite. It's got a huge enstatite in it that uh, could, could be interpreted as a former bridgmanite. So we've got evidence of a super deep origin here. So these marks, you're probably wondering what these are. And the solution to analyzing the bore, our solution to analyzing boron in diamond is to use a laser, but not in the traditional manner. The traditional manner, as we saw in Simon Jackson's talk, is to couple the laser directly to a mass spectrometer and, and fire what you're ablating straight into the mass spec. You can't do that with boron uh, for, in diamonds. You can do it for boron in other materials, but not in diamonds for a number of reasons. So our approach, 10 years or so ago, when I was at Durham, we developed what we call a closed cell ablation approach, where we ablate the diamond in situ in a closed cell, and the ablated material doesn't go anywhere. We trap it all. So here's this bespoke laser cell. You can put nine samples in here. The, the laser comes down here, and all the product stays in that cell. So here, quickly, are the data. Well, a really interesting thing about these blue diamonds, which there's a little bit of data in the Smith paper that showed this, and we've got a whole lot more now, is their delta 13C values are certainly not canonical mantle. I mean, OK, so there's one value there that's close. This is much heavier, and all these are way lighter, way out here in the crustal carbon area. Very interesting. Just as, as low as some of these eclogitic um, carbon isotope ratios from the lithosphere that we're all very happy are due to recycled crust. So what about the boron? OK. So this is new data straight off the mass spectrometer generated by my student, Margot uh, Regier. And I I'm not allowed to show you the actual data because she hasn't presented it yet. And I'd have to kill you all if I showed you the data. So, so it's shown as blue diamonds, uh, but, sorry, in a, this blue box. But, but I want you to ignore that first because what we want to focus on is what are we dealing with here in terms of isotopic space? Here's delta 11 boron. Seawater, now the reason that this is a tractable problem is because seawater has a plus 40 per mil delta 11 boron ratio. And other components such as metasediments have down to almost a minus 20 per mil in, uh, range. In fact, serpentinites on their own have almost a 60 per mil variation. So you don't need phenomenal analytical precision to, to solve this problem. And so you can see, in fact, the what happens here, it's a complex problem because the boron isotopic ratio of these end members changes when they get heated up and they transform to different phases. So the range shrinks a bit, unfortunately, but it's still a tractable problem. And basically, the story is then that here's our blue diamond range. Here are the Morb and Oib range. And this is now much better established than it was. And we've got a few values overlapping the Oib range, but we've got the majority of the values are much heavier here a much more consistent, we think, at the moment. We're getting more data, but here's the, the sort of stop press conclusion, is that we think that the boron is indeed coming from these post-serpentinite phases, and that the speculate are not metasediments, the speculate are not altered oceanic crust directly, and that the speculation from the Smith et al. paper that there is indeed, at least for the, for the interpretation we have at the moment, a whiff of seawater in these amazingly beautiful diamonds. So I'll leave you with, hopefully, a conclusion that, the, that diamonds, and in particular the super deep diamonds, provide us with a really spectacular record of plate tectonics that you just can't get at any other way. Thank you.